Hello, hello, this is Alex Burkett, and you are listening to The Long Game Podcast. In this episode, I'm chatting with Mark Schaefer. Mark is a globally recognized keynote speaker, educator, business consultant, and author. His business, Grow, is hailed as one of the top marketing blogs in the world. He's written many game-changing books, his most recent being Cumulative Advantage. In this conversation, we talk about upcoming trends in marketing, as well as how you can actually predict and jump in front of emerging trends. We also cover how to build a cumulative advantage in marketing over time, the values of building a personal brand, and we get into the nitty gritty of sculpting and writing a book. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Mark Schaefer. Yeah, let's get into the show. So like you mentioned, and I listened to this podcast you did, this post that you wrote about like the top 10 skills on LinkedIn. And you mentioned that, um, you know, they were the same things that you could have seen in 2012. You could have seen them 10 years ago. But that makes me wonder, like, could you have also seen those 20 years ago? And does that say something about like some level of consistency and foundational skills? Or like, how do you distinguish between things that are like everlasting in terms of skill sets and things that actually should be evolving like should should we have new skills every five or ten years uh well i mean it depends on your career i mean if you're in accounting or if you're in finance the world is is changing you know relatively slowly basically is determined by by you know regulations in the world of marketing though it's it's being tweaked literally every day if not every hour and I do think this, the, the necessary skill sets are, are changing. I think there are fundamental things like learning about consumer behavior and research. Certainly those, those are important, but there were things on the list and I don't have it in front of me right now. I could pull it up if we need to, but you know, it had really nothing on there about content marketing. Mm. It had nothing on there about influence marketing. And nothing on there about Web3 Metaverse, which where that is where all the money is going right now. So, uh, you know, what what does it say about our industry when, you know, it's look, you know, it's like, um, you know, they're, they're looking at conversions and SEO and, uh, you know, that's the world's moving beyond a lot of that stuff and the skill sets required to connect as marketers, I mean, it's going to be experiential. Where, where's experiential user? Where's where's customer service user interface? Mm-hmm. It's not on the list. It's like, what well, kind of? It's it's almost like an alternate an alternate universe for for where, where I see where marketing needs to go and where it still is today. Um, you know, it's 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 sort of weird. I think it represents that many companies and many leaders are really slow to change. In many ways, they're trying to hold on to the old ways. They're trying to hold on to advertising. They're trying to hold on to things that are that are easier to measure. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, you know, you can either move with the world and and keep up with the pulse of our culture, or you can you know be comfortable and do your old things and measure the old ways. You can't do both. Right. This is going to be a grandiose question to kind of <laughs> start the conversation with. But like, how do you actually how do you predict future trends? Like, um, I'm, I'm asking for you specifically how you do it. But then like, yeah, you know, the average marketer who's maybe a couple of years into their career, maybe 10 years into their career, like, how do they keep in front of this stuff as well? Like, are, what kind of information are you consuming? What kind of mental models are you using to to move with the world, so to speak? Well, I'm not sure I can really... It- explain it in terms of how 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 I do it I um I mean I've had a good track record of sort of predicting what's going to happen and what's going to come next and I realized that that it was sort of like not till my 30s I was a late bloomer trying to figure out what I was good at in this world but I was in marketing and when you have conversations with most people they dwell in the trend that's going on now. Okay. So here's an example. Remote work. All okay, right. So now we're in a pandemic and boom, remote work. And then um, so 
you talk about remote work and, and you're, you're dwelling in the trend of the moment. What I do is number one, see how trends intersect. So that's one trend, but what about this other trend? How do they intersect? And then I think through, for example, what are the implications? So everybody's talking about remote work and companies are thinking about, okay, we need to upgrade our technology. Here's what I'm thinking about. Remote work is not going to go away. And when you have more and more people working remotely, um, then um, they're going to have special needs. All right. You're going to need, you're going to need, you have IT needs. You might have childcare needs. You might have healthcare needs. You might need food delivered in the middle of the night. So I thought, look, this isn't going away. I predict we are going to have remote working communities, especially some of these old Rust Belt towns. They're going to provide incentives and they're going to create a hub where you've got 24 hour childcare, 24 hour fitness centers, 24 IT support, 24 hour everything. And I predicted this a year and a half ago. I just saw in the Wall Street Journal, this is coming true. So that's an example where I just think things through. And then you look at certain areas of the country that need to attract people. And, and, and they've got lots of buildings and they've got lots of infrastructure. They're, maybe they're close to universities, that these are going to be the perfect places to, to implement these, these hubs. And so I don't really know. I just, I'm so, I sort of geek out on trends. And I, I just I just think through, oh, okay, well, what does that really mean? If this is true, and it's going to stay this way, what's this going to look like in two years or three years? No, that's good. I, I think because you, it seem, seems like you start with something grounded in the current reality. Like there's some sort yeah. of a fundamental human behavior shift or consumer behavior yeah. shift. And then it sounds like you apply some lens to predict what problems that shift is going to bring up. Right. And then those problems to be solved are interesting opportunities. And that's where the trends lie with regards to marketing yeah. techniques or new businesses to be launched. But you're not. Uh, I mean, an example, probably my most my most famous example, and some people thought it was controversial, was and I wrote an article in 2014 called Content Shock. And this is this was like the height of everybody's getting into content marketing. And, you know, I know you were at HubSpot and they, that was the heydays of HubSpot and but you know, if you think it through, it's not sustainable because if you if you start getting too much of anything in a human system, in a natural system, in an economic system, something's got to give, something's got to change. People are producing more and more content. This the the niches will fill up. That means you've got to spend money either on promotion or on quality to compete. Mm -hmm. Then your competitors do the same thing and it becomes an arms race. Some people will win and some people are not going to be able to compete. And so content marketing is not going to be sustainable for everybody in the long term. This happened to me. <laughs> I used to be a contributor to the Harvard Business Review and they're very, very picky. So I would get maybe one out of every three or maybe four of my submissions. They would say, yeah, this is great. We're going to put it in there. And then over time, it was like one out of five, one out of seven, one out mm. of 10. And I asked the editor, what's going on? And she said, well, executives have learned it's great to be in the Harvard Business Review. They've got content firms and ad agencies creating custom articles for them to submit to the Harvard Business Review. Mark, the stuff you're turning into us would have been accepted three years ago, but how are you going to compete with these professional agencies creating custom content for these executives? The answer is, I can't. It's not competitive. I'm not, it's not sustainable for me. I dropped out. Mm -hmm. That's not to say I couldn't try submitting again someday, but that's where more and more content was getting better and better and better at a higher and higher price that me as a small business, I couldn't compete with. 
Now, who benefits? The readers. Mm-hmm. The readers benefit from the content arms race. That's why, you know, we, you know, one of the greatest shows, uh, one of the breakthrough shows of the history of television was Game of Thrones. $10 million an episode, right? Unbelievable. Mandalorian, $15 million an episode, right? Next year, we'll probably see something that's $20 million an episode. Right now, Netflix on the ropes. They don't have those deep pockets to compete like that. Amazon does. Disney does. Apple does. And so even in that sort of content to cut through, you got to have deep pockets in the long term. And that's not to say that there still aren't niches and there aren't opportunities, but from a mega trend perspective, um, you know, it's 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 harder and harder and harder to to compete and cut through. Do you think that that is inevitable in the life cycle of a channel or a tactic, something that works, so to speak, like people are going to yeah. jump on and see that they're going to get data that proves sure. that it's working. They're yeah, jump the, in and it hits the, 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 the pattern repeat, the, the pattern repeats over and over again. So, uh, you know, in some of my, um, you know, speeches, I talk about the, the history of media channels you know, starting with TV in the early days of TV. Basically, anybody could be on TV. You could go down to the state. They needed content. They were hungry for content. You could go down and do a cooking show. You could do a variety show. You could sponsor any program because it was new and it was cheap. And then it became popular. And they had what? More TV stars, better production. And here we are with The Mandalorian, $15 million an episode. I went to a conference a few years ago. There, this is when Snapchat was new. They said, "Oh my gosh, you know, it's so hard to cut through on Facebook or you know YouTube, but Snapchat, it's amazing. People see your content and you get all this engagement." In the back of my mind, I'm saying that's not sustainable. As Snapchat becomes more popular, as TikTok becomes more popular, as Twitch becomes more popular. It's harder and harder to cut through just because of the economic realities of competition. Mm. When you say it's not sustainable, though, is there a case to be made that there's some form of arbitrage when you get in early and you can maybe like sustain some cumulative advantage um, by like building up the audience when it's not as competitive? So like take for search, for example, like HubSpot getting in early and like playing like tons of long tail you know, content, like they basically spread across like they rank for every keyword now. And their domain rating so high that like if you try to compete with them, it's very hard because they've got this moat built up. But they were kind yeah. of early on that. So is is there maybe right. a case to be made jumping in early and like really scaling it out um, while it's still fresh? Yeah, I mean, I mean, really, um, that's the only strategy. Um, the only strategy is you know it's shock and awe. If you find a niche, you fill it up and dominate the. So, I mean, content shock is the solution Mm -hmm. right you want to own a niche and dominate a niche so completely that your competitors will never be able to touch you which is exactly what you know what hubspot did it's not necessarily good for business or for the world but that's how the algorithms work right and you mentioned that personal brand was a sort of moat that you had built out for yourself and that makes you less worry about you know the content shock that's going to be derived from these AI copywriting tools. So like maybe that's some emergent property that stays with you across channels. Oh, it's time. The, yeah. I mean, so that's, that's the, that, that's the only option that, that most businesses have today is that, you know, the moats are built, they're unassailable. Um, we're moving into a post SEO world. What I mean by that is, so, you know, let's say 10 years ago, I'm a digital marketing consultant. If I really hammered it out, could I, you know, get make some progress on search results for digital marketing consultant? Maybe, you know, today, uh, you know, I've written 10 books. I teach at a university. I studied under Peter Drucker. I've blogged for, you know, I've from blog for 10 years. I've had a podcast for 10, for, uh, for 10 years. Um, I've, you know, I've won all these awards. 
Will I win SEO for digital marketing consultant? No, never. Ain't going to happen. So I've got to do something else. I can't rely on that because the only people that are going to win are the meanest, richest junkyard dogs in the industry. And they're going to be battling each other out forever for those top three splots, slots on search. I can't do that. So I have to rely on authority. I've got to create content that's so interesting, so unique, so unmissable. But we'll say, I'm going to subscribe to him. I'm going to opt in to him because I love what he does. I don't want to miss a single thing. And at that point, you don't need Google anymore. And that's where the world has to go, is to is to create content that's so interesting, unmissable, and and uh, and entertaining that people opt into you, and you don't have to depend on all the money you're putting in the search. Yeah, this this may be a poor metaphor, but I'm I'm thinking about like product versus distribution, and there's like saturated distribution channels like SEO where you're competing head to head, and probably it's probably very expensive at this point. There's paid mm-hmm. acquisition, and depending on what industry you're in, it might be the same thing. And then there's new channels, right. and all of these are ways that you can discover uh, new audiences can discover your work, but the work mm-hmm. itself has to be a product worthy of its own right, and that's kind of like you're you're just using these channels to get people to you and like creating something so good that they're willing to follow you, you're building brand equity, and you're building something that lasts over time. Is that maybe right to say? No, I think you're exactly right. Cool. Um, You mentioned you studied under Peter Drucker. Yes. Um, What were some interesting lessons you learned studying under Peter Drucker? Yeah, well, it was was just a a life-changing sort of opportunity. He was um, at the end of his career, and um, he was teaching at the Claremont Graduate University in Claremont, California. Uh, they named the business school after him, the, the Drucker School of Management. And to get to be in this program, it was an MBA program. It was almost impossible to get into this program with Peter Drucker. So the people that were in there, they were like vice presidents of this and CMOs of that. And I was, I don't know, 26, 27 years old. So I applied, I applied, I applied. I kept getting turned down. So finally, I went to the dean of the business school and I said, I want to be in this program because of, you know, equal opportunity. And he said, he's looking at me, you know, I'm this, you know, white guy. And he said, what are you talking about? I said, I'm young. Mm -hmm. I said, everybody in this program is old. You need to have somebody young in this program. So this was like my fourth time applying to the program. So he let me in. And I was I was the youngest person ever in the program. And, um, you know, thank goodness I got in because it really was uh, an extraordinary a- a- experience. Peter Drucker is the smartest person I've ever known. And he's one of the few people who can take the most complicated concept and truly distill it to its essence. Hmm. And um, just as an example, somebody asked him one time, uh, you know, Professor Drucker, you go all over the world and you consult with tech companies and coal companies and food companies and airlines. How can you possibly know so much about these industries that you can help them in a meaningful way? He said, oh, it's very simple. He said, you just look for three things. He said, number one, is it clean? Is it spotlessly clean? And he's talking about like walking through manufacturing or walking through offices. He said, Mm -hmm. if the place is just a mess and filthy, it represents a culture that doesn't respect the process and the management and the products and the and the and the customers he said it's a sign of deep disrespect there's a deep problem going on if the place is filthy number two see what was number two number two was um are people in meetings all the time he said if you're in meetings and all all the time that's a culture of fear Mm. points to much much deeper issues because you're not letting people be accountable You're not letting people make decisions. 
75% of the meetings that you have should be with your customer, either internal or external. And he said, the third thing was, is there a flow? Are people fighting fires all the time? Or is there a peaceful flow to how the business is run? If there's a peaceful flow, then there are good processes in place. That probably means there's good quality in place. That probably means there's good, happy customers and profitability in place. If people are fighting fires all the time, there's deep process problems. So it's just like, here you go. Here's this guy. You know, again, he sees these very surface level things, but truly he's right. Mm -hmm. Truly, you know, you go down, if any of those things are wrong, that leads you down the rabbit hole to help that company. That's so funny. Yeah. Like they're, they're indicative of bigger problems, but it's something you can right. actually place your finger on. Cause like now and, I'm thinking about my past me. roles and like, it's totally Look, true. That's right. Yeah. That's totally true. It's totally true. If you, I look at it the same way, or even like I get to go and visit lots and lots of different types of companies. Cause I'm a consultant. And I mean, you know, I went in, I, I won't say the companies, but like on back to back days, I went to two companies in the aerospace industry and one was like a mess and the employees like had all these like profane posters and stuff on the walls. And then the other facility was like a hospital. It was like a surgical suite. Hmm. It was spotless. It was pristine and everybody was wearing white coats, you know, and, you know, hair things to keep their hair out of the process and you thought oh boy i mean the first the first one they're not going to make it and you know two years after i was there the place closed down you you could just see it was it was just seeping with problems because mm-hmm. it was so filthy um how how do you spend like a a day in the life like uh, I'm, I'm. You've written so many books, predicting future trends. I imagine you'd spend a lot of time reading, thinking. Do you have like idle time baked out? You're doing the consulting as well. Like, what's what's the day in life? Well, it sort of um, goes in different waves depending on um, uh, what's going on in the world. Um, so earlier this year, I had a big consulting contract. Um, so I spent a lot of time in, uh, training and workshops. Um, you're doing that in person too. You're, you're flying into their offices. Mm -hmm. Uh, both some virtual, Mm -hmm. some, some, uh, live, um, now, um, you know, in the fall, this is the busy season for speaking. So basically from early September to November, I'm out. Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, you know, basically doing a lot of speaking this summer, uh, especially now is a historically slow period. So this is, I'm working on a new book. So I'm writing feverishly right now, knowing that my window is going to close in a few weeks. And I've, I really, I've got to have as much of it done as I can to start getting it into the, you know, the editing process. So. It, it it sort of depends on on the season. <laughs> I'm always doing writing. I'm always doing speaking. I'm always doing consulting. But the flow of the day might be different based on what time of year it is. I love the idea of working in seasons. Um, we our first podcast guest was David Cadavy, and he wrote this book called Mind, Mind Management, Not Time Management. And one of the big theses in that was that we basically have flows through a day, through a week, through a year. And we often try to override that and just get done what we think we should, as opposed to like going with our actual flows. You know, like there's less people available for podcasts typically in the summer. So like, usually I do less of them. And like, yeah, I I think that's a great idea. But a couple of tactical questions on the writing process. So like summertime, book writing time. What time of the day do you write? Like, when do you find time? Like, are you just like, anytime you have like a, a wave of motivation or like well, you know, um, rigorous routine? It, it sort of happens, you know, when I write, I'll, I'll get, I literally, I'll get into a state of flow. Mm-hmm. So like yesterday was uh, a day, you know, I had blocked out for writing and I started kind of at seven in the morning and, um, you know, I have an office away, you know, it's, it's, it's in the woods 
a separate building from my house. So I have to like come home to dinner. It's about a, you know, 50 yard walk down the hill. And, you know, my wife is expected me for dinner and I didn't, you know, around six and I didn't show up till, till eight 30 because I was in the flow. I, I just, it was pouring out of me. You got to ride the wave when it comes. Yeah. So you got to go, you know, you can't, you can't interrupt that. You know, when you're, when you're doing something short, like a blog post, you can stop and you can start, you can stop, you can start. But when you're doing a long form content, like a book, every time you stop, you have to reorient yourself in terms of where was I? Now, did I tell that story here or did I tell that story there? And and that's the number one reason why people cannot finish writing a book because they stop and start. And every time they, they stop, it just becomes overwhelmingly disheartening because you almost have to like read everything to figure out where you are. And, you know, right now, even I'm having like a pretty good consecutive time of writing. It's still sort of confusing about, okay, wait a minute. I meant to do that. Did I need it? do I do it in this chapter or did I already do it? I better go back and look Uh, because it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of words and a lot of stories and a lot of lessons. So I personally can only do it in, in a sprint, you know, Mm -hmm. I got to, you know, so when I typically (coughs) would really work on a book would be the summer (coughs) or the winter holidays. That's when, that's when everything sort of slows down. So right now I'm in my sprint. My sprint ends, I believe, August 31st. I hit the road again. Yeah, I'm basically not going to be, you know, back till November. And then sometime around November, around Thanksgiving till early January, I've got another sprint where I could, you know, if the book isn't finished, I can I can finish it. Do you have a concrete plan for what the book is going to be? the thesis, the structure, do you have all that planned out in advance or do you, does it emerge as you're writing? Mostly it, it, it's planned out because for me, writing a book is just such a huge sacrifice. And, and, you know, by the end of this year, when the book is done, I will be completely exhausted. Mm-hmm. I mean, I will put everything I've got into this book. I mean, my only goal is I'm going to create a thing of beauty in every way, and it's going to be better than my last book. And the people who love my books, I'm not going to let them down. You know, they're going to love every page of this book. So to make that sacrifice, you really have to be sure that you're doing the right thing. So if I have an idea for a book, I don't start writing the book. I wait. I think about it. I study it. I make sure that this is how I'm going to spend, you know, you know, if you put all the research and everything together, I mean, you're thinking about this for two years. Mm -hmm. And um, so before I make that kind of commitment, I've got to be 100% sure that this is the right idea and that this is the right, this is the right time and the right book. It has to solve a problem for the world. You know, it has to be, you know, the right, the right thing that is, it's going to help people because I see a problem. I see an issue that, um, I don't understand that needs to be solved. And that becomes the book. And that's what makes it work. And do you do, cause uh, I read cumulative advantage and you had a lot of, um, anecdotes, stories, research examples from Twitter and, and the challenger and like all, all kinds of different, like, um, bits of research do you do all the research before you start writing or are you it sounds like you're not interrupting the process of writing as much as you can like manage right. so is that do you have like right. a writer's mise en place of sorts where you've got everything kind of like laid out like that and you just have to fit yep. it into the right places that's exactly what it is so um once i have a, an idea i mean you asked me is it all thought out and i said you know most of it Because once you get into it, of course, there's going to be missing holes or you go down paths that seem, you know, that were unexpected. But what I'll do, I have my feet, my core idea, and I'll think, okay, here's what I think the chapters will be. Then for about six or nine months, I just watch the world and I might see um, 
uh, an article. Oh, that would be good in chapter three. So I put it in that file, right? Evernote file, chapter mm -hmm. three. I might hear a podcast. I'll transcribe it. Those are great quotes. That goes in chapter four. So for six or nine months, I'm going, 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 going. Then it's time to write. You open up the Evernote files. You see what you have. It may be, here's a file that's empty. Well, is that really a chapter or what's going on there? Here's two chapters. They've got way too much stuff. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe it's not two chapters. Maybe I should make it into three chapters. And then it's, it's like you say, now you've got everything in front of you and you weave the story. It's not like sitting down in front of a blank screen and saying, now I have to write a book. Now you're weaving the story. You have the research, you have the quotes, you've done the interviews. You know, right now I'm writing and kind of interviewing at the same time. Um, but that, but you know, it's all kind of going together. And then I've got a virtual assistant. She's my, she sometimes is my like research assistant as well. And I'll have like some wacky thing like I'm writing. And in the middle of my writing, I need to know how many newspapers were there in Boston in 1776 and an hour later, she'll say 24, and now I've got it. Boom, put it in the book. Would you say that writing is the most rewarding part of your work and what you do? I, I can feel some energy when you when you talk about the process. Um, I mean, I, I enjoy everything that I do. I mean, um, the, the, the writing a book is, is a huge intellectual challenge. It's the biggest risk you can ever take in your career um, because, you know, you can't take it back. I mean, you can mm -hmm. take a tweet down or a blog post down, but you can't take a book down. And so when you write a book, uh, you know, you better make sure it's, it's, it's right because it becomes part of your brand forever. Um, so it's, it, it, it's difficult, but I've learned that I'm good at it. I mean, when I wrote my first book, it was terrifying. And I never had a dream to write a book. It just sort of, you know, it was an opportunity that happened. So I said, sure, you know, I'll try it. Didn't was the first one on influencer marketing or what, what was the first one? Yeah. Well, I wrote a I wrote a little book that I that I I so I was approached by McGraw Hill. Mm -hmm. And McGraw Hill wanted me to write a book. And I said, Well, I have an idea for a book. I want to write a book on Twitter because at that point. Twitter was huge and hot and everybody was focused on the technology and the confusing language and hashtags. And what I realized is that Twitter is the most human driven platform. And I wanted to focus on really opening people's eyes to sort of the humanity behind Twitter. Well, they said, okay, great, do it, but it's gotta be 240 pages. And I said, I'm not going to write a 240 page book on Twitter. I want to write a little book that people can read fast and get it. So they said, well, we don't want it. So I did it on my own and it became the best selling book on Twitter. Then I said, well, I've got this other idea. I see that the, the power of the world is shifting from the big ad agencies and media companies down to the people. And as people start to blog and create content, the power is going to be there. And when the power, this is another example of me, like thinking through the trends and all of a sudden it's like, the, it was like the, the lights on a runway at O'Hare. The mm -hmm. whole idea is just like, holy cow, marketing is going to be changed forever. These people, you know, once we have all, you know, more and more people blogging and making videos and they are going to they are going to be the tastemakers they are going to have the power and and the whole the whole um center of marketing is going to shift and so you know i wrote this uh in 2011 it was published in 2012 before anybody was using the word influence marketing it was the first book on influence marketing and i said in 2 years this is going to be a mainstream marketing trend and go look up google trends influencer marketing in 2014 it shoots up like a rocket 
Um, so, you know, the opportunity was presented to me. I wanted to try it as an experiment just to learn to do it, to see if I could do it. You know, it was very, very scary. I mean, the books I'm doing now are much better th than the books that I wrote at the beginning because I think I'm better at it. I'm more confident. And when you write with a publisher like McGraw-Hill, they have a certain way they want the book to sound. So they take me out and put them in. Mm -hmm. Now I self-publish my books and it's all me. So I think the books are a lot more fun, a lot more interesting than the early days. Have you dealt with any of the risks and downsides that you mentioned with the prospect of writing a book? Um, have you had, you know, some people pigeonhole you because you wrote about like say Twitter or influencer marketing and like people only want you to talk about that and you want to move on to the next idea. Have you faced any of the kind of downsides of, of writing? Probably, but I don't know it or I don't care. I mean, I think <laughs> I've had the opposite problem really is that I haven't pigeonholed myself enough. You know, I mean, if you think about it, Alex, I wrote the first book on influence marketing. I could have been the man. I could have been the dude of influence. I could have created the influ you know, the biggest influence agency in the world. I had no interest. It would, I would have been completely bored doing one thing every day. I would have been completely unhappy running an agency. I, so I, so then I moved on to the next thing, you know, and I, you know, wrote a book on personal branding. I wrote a book on content marketing, you know, the cumulative advantage you mentioned. It's a book really about business momentum mm -hmm. because to me, it's, you know, it, I, you have to enjoy the journey of writing the book. And, and every time I write a book, it's like getting a new master's degree. You're studying and writing for two years. That's a master's degree. So I've become a much, much better marketer, a much better holistic marketer by not just focusing on 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 one area i think readers can also tell when you're like either passionate about something or you're if you're phoning it in to try to like you know craft a personal brand in a very like efficient way and like with narrow guardrails like trying to be this person like i, I at mm -hmm. least i i can i think i can tell when people are doing that but that's something yeah. i struggle with it's like do you go do you craft a personal brand intentionally and like become the Shopify guy or the email marketing copywriter or whatever that is, I, my inclination is to like follow my interests. And those are like pretty scattered. So, but but yeah. I always wonder if I'm like leaving something on the table by like uh, making that trade off and not being more intentional about like one avenue like that. I, I think, I think there's a risk to that strategy. I mean, I see a lot of people do it like you do. Um, but let's put it this way. I can name five people who bet their careers on being the Google plus guy. <laughs> mm -hmm, totally. <laughs> right. So I'm more of a generalist. And I think the way I remain relevant is by looking at, okay, what do I do? What are my skills and how is the world changing? And instead of like just picking one path, I'll just say, well, look, how do I apply my my skill, my talents in a new way that's relevant to the way the world is moving, you know, right now? I think if you want to be a real true marketing professional, you you can't you can't be, I mean, a lot of people say niche down, niche down. But it, it depends on what you want to do, I guess. If you want to be a great marketing professional, you can't just do one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you're doing a disservice to your customers and really to the world because now you become a hammer looking for a nail. You're the Facebook's ads person, right? So now every solution is Facebook ads. That's why people trust me because I don't have an agenda, right? I know a little bit of everything. I'm going to push people in the right direction, no matter what that direction might be. I see that all the time. Uh, I won't name names, but on LinkedIn and Twitter, like people who I know yeah. who've got like one ideology within a channel. It's like, yeah. I, I know when they post, I know exactly what they're going to write and what their point of view is going to yeah. be. It's it's yeah. so predictable at this point. Yeah. And there, I mean, there might be enough people that need that. 
or fall for that. Um, and you know, maybe they can make a business that way. But you know, at a certain type time, at least for me, I would be completely bored doing that. You know, being on that same treadmill day after day after day. I mean, I like I like learning new things. I'm always I'm very motivated about learning new things. And, um, you know, that's certainly reflected in, in the scope of the books that I've written. And you studied behavioral science, right? I did. I got a master's degree in applied behavioral sciences. Yeah. That's because I feel like there's this underpinning um, of, of kind of like how you view things, which is like by the behavior, by the trends, by the shift, tectonic shifts, and not necessarily by the tools that arise from it. So do you think there was any influence of studying that early on that impacted how you look at the marketing yeah. world? Yeah, absolutely. Because the most fascinating thing to me is that intersection of technology and strategy and humanity. That's marketing, you know, and that's, I mean, I, I, I just, I love that. It's just endlessly fascinating. You know, whenever uh, someone comes up with a, uh, you know, a, a, a lead nurturing program and it works, but everybody hates it. Okay. Now you're, you've got technology at odds with human nature, but it works, but people hate it, but it works, but people hate it. You know, and I'm in the camp. If people hate it, don't do it. Mm. You know, find, find something else, you know, don't, you know, I hope people will do something more with their lives and spam their way to success. Um, that's my hope for marketing. Um, you know, I think marketing can be a bright light. You know, we're at the front lines. We're creating the products. We're listening to the customers. We're creating the content. We're the we're the beam. You know, and and we can we can be good. We can help. We can serve. Instead of manipulating people, we can come alongside them at their point of need and be someone that they that they love instead of someone that is spamming them and they want to, you know they want to avoid us. What what drives you generally? Like to write, to speak, to create? Is it it because I've heard a couple times you've mentioned being useful, being helpful, helping people solve yeah. problems. Is it the chasing of new ideas and innovation and like creativity? What is the driving force behind what you do? Well, it's it's changed. You know, it, it, at the beginning, it was about uh, uh, creating a business and just being able to, you know, feed my family. And then I realized that the I could have a bigger impact than, you know, Knoxville, Tennessee, that I was starting to have an impact on the world. I could paint on a bigger canvas. So I sort of started to explore that. And I never had a plan. It was not a design to have a personal brand. Just like most people, I kind of stumbled my way through it and eventually figured it out. Uh, and now, now it's like, okay, um, you know, uh, I'm painting on a bigger canvas now. I've moved from like this corporate world where I was lucky to get a performance review once a year to a world where people are saying, I love you every day. That's kind of interesting. You know, now I'm at a point where um, you know, every week, at least once a week, someone writes me, sends me a note, says, you've changed my life. I think as a human being, you'd be lucky to hear that one time. And I hear it all the time. That's fuel. I mean, that's fuel. And I, uh, I'm going way off course here, Alex. No, this but, is great. You know, I went, uh, a few weeks ago, I went to see a Rolling Stones concert. You know, Mick Jagger's 78. 79, I think. The Rolling Stones are worth a billion dollars. 
Keith Richards had to sit down most of the show and his hands are all gnarled. And it just makes you wonder why. Why do they do it? They don't have to do it. I mean, I just can't imagine what Mick Jagger has to do physically to get ready for these shows and how much pain he must be in after these shows. And I thought at some point you make this transition where you're no longer a musician, you're a Rolling Stone. It's existential. And I think that's what's happening with me is that I'm no longer a blogger or a podcaster. I have this place in the world where it's existential. So like, why would I stop? Mick Jagger is not going to stop. It's who you are. It's what you do. It's what you love. You're bringing joy to people. Why would I stop that? You know, why would I stop my daily performance review? (laughs) You know, so, uh, and I, I have fun every day. I get to meet cool people like you. So why stop? I love that. That was a great answer. Why stop? Um, The Rolling Stones, I also saw last November, and I can say, I can confirm that Mick Jagger's moving like he's, like he's in his late twenties. Like the guy, he's not phoning in those shows. Like he is truly doing it for the the love of the game. He is incredible. I thought the same thing. I was like, this is actually pretty profound. Obviously, like being one of the most iconic bands of all time, but the fact that they're not just, they're doing it for fun. You know, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. And I saw, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I saw Paul McCartney. Same thing, right? I mean, he 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 played a concert for two and a half hours and never left the stage. It's incredible. Yeah, I love that. This is, uh, I think, an excellent way to wrap up. Um, that was a super inspirational answer. Um, can you let people know where to find you online? Um, maybe mention your books to check out, like anywhere, any resources you would send people to learn more about you? Yeah, it's easy to, to find me. Uh, it's it's hard to remember how to spell my name Schaefer. It's spelled a lot, of, a lot of different ways, which is why from the beginning I called my website "Businesses Grow." So if you can remember "Businesses Grow," you can find everything about me. My books are there, my blog, my podcast, and lots of different resources and social media connections. It's all there. Businessesgrow.com. Amazing. Thank you so much, Mark. This is super fun. All right. Thank you. 